You're listening to 105.9 The Region. Welcome back to On The Market, York Region's only radio real estate show. I'm station manager Tina Cortez, and my co-host is Asif Khan with REMAX Prime Properties. Thank you, Tina. Joining us next is Ricky Rathor, owner of REMAX Empire and founding partner at Rathor Big. Welcome back, Ricky. Thank you. Thank you for having me again. Ricky, we've uh, started to get to the point uh, of the year where a lot of properties are now starting to close. And we've had some instances where the banks haven't been ready and we've had to ask for extensions. Now, what does that entail from a a legal perspective? And are clients leaving themselves open for lawsuits when something like this happens? So it's it's not normally the bank not being ready. It's usually a combination of the borrower not putting together the right pieces of the puzzle together, and then it's causing delays. And the key thing to remember here is that when you sign an agreement of purchase and sale, more often than not, the agreement of purchase and sale has a time is of the essence clause in it. And so the parties are mutually agreeing when they enter into that contract that time is really important. And so as a offset of that, if you've got a closing date, for example, for the 31st of May, the contract requires you to close no later than 6 p.m. At 6.01, if you haven't closed, you're in breach of contract. Now, you could be in breach because you're a seller and you haven't been able to provide the property or the buyer because you haven't been able to provide the property. So it can go either way. But time is really important. Now, when, when an extension absolutely has to be done, is it the realtor doing it on an amendment or is it the lawyers taking over? Where is that line that says, okay, you can no longer do an amendment, you need to go through the lawyers? Is it two weeks before, is it a month before, or do the lawyers just work this out at the end? So it really depends. I think most realtors will want to make an effort to have the actual amendments reduced into writing. Okay. Um, As far as we are concerned as attorneys, it can go either way. The main thing is, is plugging it so that it benefits your specific client. So if you represent the buyer, you just want an extension. You don't want any conditions attached to that. Whereas if you represent the seller, you might say, hey, I want another deposit. I want you to put your money where your your mouth is. You want another 30 days? I want another $20,000 deposit, right? Now, our closing date set for the 31st of May, which means that taxes, maintenance fees, all of those things that we adjust on what we call the statement of adjustments, those are adjusted as of, as of the 31st. That adjustment should stay as of the 31st. So if you want another 30-day extension, I'm not going to pay for any of those adjustments. They remain your responsibility. On top of that, I've got a mortgage payment. I've got other things that I have incurred. And so you can negotiate what the buyer who is in default at that time is going to be responsible for in the event that they want the extension. Now, there's so many new builds happening across the region. These extensions or these delays and closings seem to be happening more often than not. It's really circumstantial. So it goes both ways. If you've seen some of the recent case law, you see there's a, a lot of developments that have gone up in value substantially. And so the builder comes back and says, hey, we're not extending it, but we'll give you the opportunity to repurchase the property at the higher price. Yikes. They don't have to agree to an extension. And that's the key point here. Once you sign that contract, you want to make sure you're able to do what you can to close that transaction. If you can't, you're going to end up in a really funny situation, depending on the other side and their strength. And also when you're representing a seller, I mean, sometimes there's penalties involved. How are these penalties calculated? Is it per diem? Is there a flat penalty that you can charge? Because often sellers have already purchased a property as well, and they're you know, on the hook to close on that property on time. So just because the buyer of their property isn't able to close doesn't mean that it's just a straightforward extension. Yeah. So more often than not, when you've got someone who can't close, it creates a domino reaction, just like you said, because you've bought the property, you've sold the property, someone's going to close. So it, it, it sets up a series of different chain of events, which are, are, are going to become highly problematic. And so in a situation like this, the per diem means per day. And so One thing to appreciate is that you can't just call your lawyer and say, I want $20,000 as damages. You can't just make up damages. They have to be substantiated. And so if the damages are reasonable as a result of the breach of contract, you can try to get those damages from the other party. But again, it's all in good faith and good dealings and negotiation. You might want something. The buyer may not be able to provide it to you. And so now you have to step back as a seller and say and think to yourself, do I want to risk losing the transaction and then end up back on the market and then have to sue this buyer? Or should I take what I can get at this point and make reasonable efforts to make uh, the transaction close? I'll give you one example now. Uh, there was a recent situation where the appraised value on a property came out $80,000 lower. Buyer goes to the builder and says, 
I need you to reduce the price by 80000 because that you know the bank has come down so conservatively on the appraisal. The builder came back and said, we're not going to do that. But the factual reality was is if the builder tried to relist that property and sell it, they weren't going to get – they were going to get even less than that. And so in negotiating that with the builder, we were able to negotiate it, not 80, but at least halfway. We met halfway because we told the builder that if you went and rejected this reasonable request to mitigate and you went and resold the property and now you lose $200,000, we're not going to allow you to sue us for that kind of a difference because we've already offered to bridge the gap with the 40000 And so that was a good story where it actually worked out, but it doesn't always work out that way. Yeah, and what about those stories that work in favor of the builder? You know, there are a ton of condos, uh, Asif, you've mentioned this, that are going up across the region, and they're new build condos. Uh, Folks have purchased them at a certain price. We've seen the price of the condo go up over the last few years. What if the builder comes back and says, you know what, the price of this condo is now going up. Can they do that? No, they can't do that. So once the contract is signed, the contract is signed. Okay, um, so what you've agreed to is that uh, that's that's what the purchase price is going to be. Whether the market goes up or down, it goes both ways. That's the deal you've made, and that's what you've got to to uphold. And, and how does that work when you're uh, trying to get out of a deal and an extension is not possible, or, or you're in a deal and the extension is not possible? Is it best just to sign a mutual release? I mean, we've heard that uh, if you sign a mutual release, the seller of the home is now unable to. Uh, sue for damages. How does that uh, play out? So it really depends on the language. So if you're using the standard ORIA form, that's a full and final release, which means that, yes, you've cut your legs out if you want to sue. And so one of the things we always do as attorneys is if we want an extension and the, the buyer agrees to pay another deposit, we also have all of the parties sign off on a irrevocable direction to release the deposits without actually entering into a settlement. Now, what that means in simple English is that you're going to pay me another $10,000. I've got $10,000 already in trust. That money cannot be released unless there's a court order or a settlement, mutual release. And so in lieu of, if the parties direct the lawyers and the brokerages, all of the parties, the buyers and sellers say, look, we agree that if we don't close on the next extending, uh, extension date, we agree that the broker of records authorized to release this money. Now, that benefits the seller because they don't have to sue now. They get the money up front. Now they can mitigate loss and and they can take things in tandem. Whereas if you sign the mutual release, now you can't really sue. You've just, you've walked away with your deposit, however it's structured, and you're basically agreeing to walk away from the transaction without being able to sue after the fact. So you have to structure it carefully. And and Ricky, you guys are now getting into your busy season. Uh, This is when properties are starting to close. So obviously this is going to be a time where you see a lot more of this. Are you seeing more people ask for extensions this year or, you know, in previous years when the market was not as busy as it is right now? So our law, we do a lot of transactions. We're a transaction-based law firm uh, because we specifically specialize in real estate transactions. And so that's the nature of our business. And we see, we see all sorts of things all the time. And so I can't, if I look in comparison to the previous years, it's no different really. It all falls back on the situation and the individual and how prepared they are for the closing. Some people think that they're going to wing it. They've got bad advice from a mortgage agent or a banker or whoever the case may be. And so sometimes I, I have to unfortunately involve myself in situations where very vulnerable people have trusted professionals and really gotten burned by that experience. And so, you know, irrespective of what your professional tells you, make sure you've got it in writing, make sure you've got your paper trail before you start, you know, waiving and fulfilling your conditions. So that's your piece of advice going forward is that, you know what, have a lawyer involved right out of the gate. Possibly, yeah. Just make sure that, you know, if somebody says your financing is approved, Look at the commitment. Make sure it's signed off. Look at what the conditions are. Most of these commitments have conditions. If you've got a condition for an appraisal, make sure the appraisal is done during that five-day condition period. Don't wait till a week before the closing. And a lot of people will get their uh, commitment and then try to shop around, and that usually complicates it right there because now you're opening up a can of worms because your next commitment may not come in in time. So, you know, that's another thing that we try to tell our clients is, if you're looking for a better deal, uh, quite often it's not around because you have to compare products to products. You probably see that a lot in that uh, when people are shopping for different savings or, or different types of mortgages, that's when deals always have to get extended because the banks can't come through in time. That's right, yeah. And, and that's exactly what it is. It's definitely an, it's an avoidable situation. But I think a lot of people get very complicated with it and they're trying to save a couple of percentages, you know, and it's fair. Nobody wants to spend money unnecessarily, but you have to be very careful because if you've signed off on that commitment, you've signed off on that agreement, the expectations are going to close. 
Well, Ricky, great information again. Thank you very much, and we look forward to having you on next month. Thank you. Thank you. Always a pleasure. And if our listeners want more information, how can they connect with you, Ricky? Uh, they can go online at rathorbaig.com, R-A-T-H-O-R-E-B-A-I-G.com, or give us a call at 416-731-8478. When we come back, we get to your real estate questions and this week's hot listing. And just a reminder, if you missed any part of our show, go to 1059theregion.com and click on Schedule. You're listening to 1059 The Region. Stay with us. Need to connect with Asif Khan from Remax Prime Properties? Call him. 